Hi everyone and welcome to another BAPT webinar. Uh, I'm Richard Owen, the current treasurer and a trustee of the BAPT, that's the British Association for Psychological Type. We are a not-for-profit charity here in the UK. Um, our mission is to share knowledge and best practice to do with psychological type uh, and to join the community of people who are practitioners um, interested in this area. Tonight I'm joined by a presenter author and coach from New Zealand, uh, another expert in psychological type, Sue Blair, and uh, she's gonna share with us some of her thoughts about the dominant and inferior functions in type. So uh, welcome, Sue, how are you doing? Thank you, yeah, thank you, it's great to be here. It's a sunny morning here in New Zealand. Lovely, yeah, so it looks, yeah, you've got summer, right, over there right now? We certainly have, peak, peak summer, it's gonna be hot. <laughs> Beautiful. So, um, and I know you're coming over to join us in the UK again for the BAPC conference in April, is that right? Uh, absolutely, yes. I, uh, my favourite at conference, I have to say, it's a, a lovely event. So, I'm sure there will be many other type enthusiasts uh, joining us. It will be great. Yeah, it'll be a fantastic one. Um, are you presenting on the same topic there, or have you got a different uh, talk lined up for us? Uh, so I'll be presenting on this topic, so invoking the inferior function, which I think is um, yeah, a bit of a hot topic for me and my brain is whirring around with it quite a lot at the moment. So uh, I, th I thought I'd just give that a, a try and see what other people think. I think one of the great things about these conferences as type uh, professionals is that we can really just give anything a whirl and just make the most of the fact that you've got a room full of type people who, who really do understand type, especially type dynamics, and that's unusual. So, you know, in the presenting work that I do, you very rarely get to be able to present on the things that are a little bit more detailed and, and that uh, gives you the opportunity to, to do that and to learn from everybody else. I quite like the expression that when one teaches, to learn. And I think when you're presenting and you're, te you're teaching anything, then you're learning just as much from the audience that you, you're with. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and I think, like you say, we, we're sort of pushing the boundaries of of um, thought in the area and a lot of the people that come to the conference are thought leaders in the area so it's great to know that you know we don't have to go over this, the, the basics it, it really does push things mm -hmm. different levels um, yeah. so I'd like to ask you a quick few questions about your, your own journey into yes. where you are now in this world and then you know how did you first get into learning about psychological type? Uh, I had a corporate background basically and I didn't really learn much about type throughout that time, just sort of little little bits of sales management courses and that kind of thing. And I guess I became really enthusiastic about it when I had my two children, Louisa and James, who just were born different. And in order to be a good parent to them, I thought, you know, my goodness, I'm going to have to understand this a whole lot. So they, uh, they were significantly different from birth. Um, my daughter Louisa has ISTJ preferences and my son ENTP. So you can imagine what that might, what that dynamic might do. And I just thoroughly enjoyed that whole process. So having gone through a lot of um, work doing parenting and looking at parenting skills and, and helping other parents understand the types of their children, I sort of went back to the corporate world and also into school. So as you can imagine, their journey through the education system was also very different. So now I have the umbrella of, of dealing with personality in all my works. I think I'm unusual in that, that my work is purely on, on type. Um, but underneath that umbrella, I work with businesses, with schools, in coaching, um, writing resources, which I love doing, having the, the coaching cards available, not just for my own use. So originally I wrote them because it's what I thought I needed to help explain type to other people. Um, and then other people seem to look at them and go, well, that, you know, can I have a few of those? So that's where that started from too. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been a good journey. And uh, there as well, your, your type preferences are ESTJ, is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, I was actually an ESFJ for about the first two years of my type journey until, until I saw the light and realised that I probably came out actually as moderate F, even on the original MBTI questionnaire that I did. But at the time, I was you know, primary carer for two preschoolers. So I think there are moments in your life when what it is that you're doing absolutely reflects in the... Um, you know how the, the questionnaire results come out and it certainly did for me it just took me quite a few 
workshops and certification programs and all sorts of things to go, oh, you know, I don't think that's quite right for me. So I learned to embrace the, uh, the ESTJ um, type description for me, my type preferences, yeah, and I'm very clear on them now. So, so when you recognise that at the time you were expressing extroverted feeling a lot because of the mm -hmm. things you were in life, how did you come to connect with extroverted thinking and how did it present itself as something more central to, to your life as a whole? I think I realized that my decision making process was a lot more logical, objective, fly on the wall. That, that's where that's my go to place. And I think I was very confused that I thought that extroverted feeling meant that, you know, especially when I learned that it was my demonic. I thought, oh, my goodness me, this is really not good. <laughs> this is something I actually quite like. Uh, but I realized that um, I, I could be a good person and still be an ESTJ. <laughs> a friend of mine has got a, a car number plate and just got ENFP on it as her car registration plate. And I just thought, heavens, if I put ESTJ as my car number plate, then people are going to avoid me. I think I've got some sort of road rage. So a lot of type descriptions that I read of ESTJ were a lot too bullish you know they, they didn't seem to suit me I'm so, I feel like I'm a much softer ESTJ than many but so it took me a while to to embrace it but I do now understand where extroverted feeling comes into the piece in, as part of as part of the whole and I think also it confused me having um, that as a dominant function I'm definitely a, um, a dominant uh, extroverted decision maker that was absolutely clear and uh, it, it was confusing for a while, but um, I've sorted it. I've, I've seen the light. <laughs> I'm interested sometimes how the dominant shows up when we're younger and the sort of things, sort of games we play and the sort of things we do as kids. And mm -hmm. is there stuff that, you know, did, you, did it show up for you in, in terms oh. of organising and managing? Oh, hugely. <laughs> I was at a workshop with Jane Kesey once. And we were talking about, you know, what we were like as a child. And I said to her, I went to primary school with a briefcase. <laughs> and she, she just about fell under the table laughing. And she just said, can I use that one? I said, absolutely, please feel free. So the briefcase that I had at primary school uh, contained everything in order. You know, I had notepads. I had, um, I had those felt pen packets that had all the colours and of course they were all in order and all in the rainbow order so the yellows went to the blues which went to the greens which went to the, you know it was absolutely insane um so you know from those very early days I just had a love of of sorting a love of ordering a, a, all of that kind of thing it, it just came absolutely naturally to me and uh so I'm certainly the only ESTJ in my family my family mix is hilarious with, um, with four siblings, three of them are INTPs, and my dear twin sister, who's an INFP, and myself as an ESTJ. So you can imagine how, how different I was from the rest of my family. Yeah, it's interesting, like you say, how these things show up, you know, in our natural interests. Even yeah. At an age. Um, you know, I, I was much more of a, as an introverted intuitive, much more of a sort of dreamy, like, asking always asking why and like trying to get to some kind of universal understanding of things you know even from a very young age it was just yeah gorgeous yes I, I don't know if I asked why a lot I just did it <laughs> exactly just do it that's a good motto <laughs> absolutely mm. so now you've got to this point in your career like what, what's you spend most of your time doing in your work so I guess there's three areas of, of my work. So I'm doing presenting a lot. So I've presented quite a bit just recently at schools because it's the beginning of the school year. So we actually, down here, we very sensibly have the school year as our calendar year. Uh, so working with primary schools um, in for teacher-only days at the beginning of the year. So I've done that uh, quite a bit over the last few days. Uh, but also just uh, Coaching, doing executive coaching, family coaching, I enjoy all of those sorts of things and, and keeping up with, uh, with the products that I'm writing too. I have another couple in mind just at the moment, so I'm, I'm always wearing on the go. Mm. And, and the products that you're producing, like the cards and things, is there, mm -hmm. are there new things on, in the pipeline? Uh, I'd love to do one on temperament. Um, and also, I've, I've got a slight interest in the Enneagram just at the moment, which is not a type resource, but, I, but so many people here seem to be talking about the Enneagram. And, and just as I had no 
idea how to describe type until I had the cards. Uh, I feel the same about Enneagrams, which is, um, which is just another interesting area of, of research. And I'm interested here, because you, you come up with such good sort of concrete materials and, and always have a focus on you know, explaining things in, in a really straightforward way for people, um, rather than the more abstract, which is how I'd probably tend to was. <laughs> do, you, do you find that that's something that you bring to the table, really, in a world which is where, where especially sensing, people with sensing preferences are more common in the tight world? I mean... Yes, I, I think I do. And I think, you know, the world out there has many, many ESTJs. The tight community has very few. And so I was, I think it was part of my, not quite strategy, but it was what I wanted to bring to the type community as, as an unusual type within it and, and how I can use my natural skills. And I, I love being with people who have intuiting preferences. I think it's just great, but oh my goodness, you make everything so complicated. <laughs> so I think it was just uh, an attempt for me to work out in my own head what all of these things meant that enabled me to just put things down in a, a very ordered, ordered way, in, in a way that actually had a, a sequence made sense to me. Um, and then that enabled me to, to really speak to others with a language that I understood. And seemingly other people really enjoy it too. So it's, it's, it's been nice to be able to provide that. And so when you're producing like, uh, something to present or some materials, What's the driving thing in your mind behind that? What, what's, what do you have to meet? What kind of criteria to, to make it work for you? Um, I really enjoy putting presentations together. I, I believe, uh, we'll come on to some slides in a moment, but, but using images to put across a message, people think that's an intuiting thing, but it is such a sensing thing that we need to be grounded in an image or something that, that shows us that it's real. Uh, and my, I guess my driving force, we're, we're talking about, uh, inferior function you know it's the, I think the drive that the, the fuel that the inferior function gives you to really help the dominant do its work I think is hugely important so I really do think that I'm, I'm sort of fueled by that introverted feeling which is do something that matters you know don't just do something for the sake of it but do something that is that is worthwhile and important and that, that fits with your your values and it, it seems to me that the work that I do, so I, I work with uh, corporates and not-for-profits and schools and all sorts of different places. But, you know, it's that sense that I get that this is important stuff. If, the, if there are patterns to human beings, then this is a really important thing to understand, not only about yourself, but about the other people who are around you. And the difference it can make is astounding. And it's amazing that there are patterns to human beings. So we can see patterns in almost everything in life. You know, if you look at tree roots or rivers or, you know, blood vessels or whatever it is, there's, there's patterns there. So why shouldn't there be patterns to the mind? And, uh, you know, typology just allows us to see those patterns quite clearly. So then you have to not only see the patterns, but then be able to explain them coherently and co in, in a way that people can really go, yeah, I think that's correct. I think that, that actually fits, fits my mind too. Mm. It's a wonderful description, yeah, of how the two functions can work co in a complementary way. You know, mm. being extremely driven to get things done and do make things happen, but the underlying it is this: it's got, but it's got to be something that matters. It's got to be something, yeah, right. Absolutely, and I think it probably took into my sort of thirties before I sort of before that kicked in. You know, I was very happy in the corporate world, as many ESTJs are. Uh, but, you know, come sort of early 30s, I was, I was really ready to do something, do something different. Whether, whether I can actually say that's when introverted feeling kicked in, then I'm, I'm, I'm not really too sure. I wasn't a, a type trained person at that point in time. But, you know, you do get to the point where you go, is this it? You know, is this what I'm doing? Uh, and I'm sure people of many types come to the same conclusion. But, um, but that, that definitely was around about that age for me. That's wonderful. Well, should we get into the slides and maybe we can expand a bit sure. this as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I just put together some slides just to, um, oh, just to direct my own thinking. I would say probably the the best way. I was I was quite pleased. I have to say, Richard, with my image here, where I managed mm. to find balancing the dominant inferior function, and the inferior function actually has a shadow. Yay! Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so that was great. But um, I do think that it is and can be a, a good balance. And I call the inferior function the balancer, which I'll come to uh, in another slide. 
because I think that is the positive role. We, we talk too much about it being inferior, I think. Um, Linda Behrens calls it the aspirational function, so it's the, which I also think is a nice word and it seems to be a positive word. But yeah, calling it inferior, I think is, um, yeah, it's, it's less than respectful in many ways. I'd much rather call it something else. So um, I've been doing quite a bit of work looking at Mark Hunziker's book, In-Depth Typology, which I've really valued. I think it's a, a great book if you want to go that little bit further. And so a lot of what he said is sort of in form of what my current thinking is on the inferior function. And he puts it in a very good way. It's still complex, but I think it, it, it certainly suits me. I guess the, my influences from type were initially Isabel Myers and then going to Jung. And then looking at BB and getting quite confused um, until I read Mark Hunziker's book, and it seems to sort things out in my mind. Possibly he's an INTJ as well, and so that distinctly, I think there's a TJ way of him writing, which seemed to to click with me a whole lot more. So I've got some reflections on what I gained from the work that he did, but I've been mulling around in my head, which I just want to to share with everybody. Mm. Uh, first of all. The idea that if you're going to differentiate, you have to want to do this. It's not going to happen without you wanting to. So to understand what it is you might be getting from that inferior function and just going, yes, it's, it's time. And I think when I first started to understand certainly the eight functions and BB's, um, BB's archetype model, I just couldn't get it into my head. I just wasn't ready to listen. But several years later, I was. And it's that need, you know, you feel that energy and that drive to get to that point where you go, so what, what is it that I can actually get out of, out of this function? And also to develop the inferior function, you've got to create a place to do that. And that's almost a sort of a psychological space. You've got to open up a space in your mind to let these ideas come in and let the questions that the inferior function should be asking you um, into your world. And with your dominant and auxiliary function, it happens so automatically that it doesn't really need to be questioned. It's there. It's, you know, you don't need to invoke it. So you don't need to do anything like that. It just sits within you. But the other functions don't necessarily. They, they sort of come up and, and, and sort of ask questions at a later stage in your life. And, uh, and I think you need to feel um, sort of at your best, I think, in order to be able to, to listen to them. And another thing is that the hero can often convince us that it's a waste of time. So your hero can run away with itself and have a whale of a time. And I think a lot of uh, analysts are thinking that it's, it's not the shadow that's giving you the most problems. It's actually the hero function that's just having too much space. And it just runs, runs riot and, and gets, becomes too exaggerated. So, you know, in those sort of situations, then, then you really do need to get that balance of the inferior function or the, that uh, balancing function. Um, but your hero sometimes isn't ready to listen. So it's a little bit like if you're really, really overstressed at work and then somebody says, well, why don't you take a week off? You're just not going to do that. You don't want to listen to that bit of advice, even though that could be a you know, marvellous bit of advice. You think, I've got work to do. And your hero function can do exactly the same thing. It's like, I'm busy here. You know, don't distract me with something else because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to just do this thing that I, that I do. Um, and also, the, I think conflict forces us to seek the wisdom of the inferior because when we get into a bit of a mess, we realise that what we have thought that we did so well is not working for us. And so then you need to stop and think, what else should I be, be listening to? Um, and then it becomes a bit of a survival tool. You know, when you know it's there for you, then you can go, okay, this, what I normally do is, is not working. Um, I quite like that. Uh, I think it's Einstein who says it's the definition of insanity is to keep doing what you always do and, and expect a different result. And I think that happens a lot when your dominant function just becomes too dominant and then you, you think something's going to change and, oh, you know, it just doesn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they, they would sort of summarise some of the, the key points. How do you relate that to your own journey that you were just reflecting on before? Um, I think certainly it's that desire that I've wanted to include that function is really important. 
I was talking to you earlier, Richard, and talking about my twin sister who has completely opposite preferences to me. So as uh, my preference is ESTJ and hers are INFP. So I've been raised side by side with somebody who is uh, extremely dear to me now. I can't say it was like that all throughout our, our teenage years, but you know, you have these uh, siblings are there for you to learn from, I think. But having a, a, a twin sister who's absolutely my opposite has been fantastic because I have a, an experience, you know, an absolute experience of somebody who I truly admire and love, who has that, um, my inferior function as their dominant function. And I think over the years, certainly, um, certainly now, we have learned to respect each other and to really gain from the wisdom that we get from that, that opposite. So we, we talk regularly and, you know, we have deep conversations, uh, you know, probably better conversations with my, my sister than I do with many, many people in my life, although I do like to, you know, I have, have very, people who I consider to be great friends. But my sister is a very special connection, possibly a, a twin thing, but just also just gaining the benefit from the inferior function in, personified, really. And that's been hugely important. So I, I will always seek her counsel and she does mind when she gets in a bit of a hole and it, it works beautifully for us. So I think that's probably the, the most significant thing. Um, for me with this and, and personally I, I see a lot in introverted feeling I see there's a lot of wisdom there that, that I try and incorporate but I equally know I can forget about when I've got a little bit of a, an extrovert thinking role on which um, which is which usually comes to grief I have to say. Mm. I, I'm interested in like you know that being your let's say inferior and, and that's interesting actually because when I think when you talk about the words superior and inferior it's, it's interesting that Jung was a psychiatrist, so he was like medically trained. And actually the words in, in medical speak just literally mean above and below, you know, in the sense yeah. that the head is superior, mm -hmm. than inferior. But it's interesting, yeah. he may have meant it more that way rather than a sort of, yeah. this sort of value laden term of inferior that we would use in every language. Yes. Um, mm. That's yeah, very interesting because it is, because um, we tend to think it of, of best and worst but maybe it wasn't intended like that. I've never thought about that. That's an interesting thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and um, the other th the question I was going to ask is about you, you and your sister, were, you know, the, the sort of the depth to which she actually feels things, you know, in this literal sort of visceral gut sort of sense. Mm. You know, how, how, how much, let's say on a, on a scale of one to 100, do you think, you come even close to experiencing what she does with that function, even though you've integrated it a bit. Uh, lovely question. I think possibly at best, I might be 50% at best. <laughs> that mm -hmm. might be optimistic. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, but she, and she might say the same thing about um, extroverted thinking. But I think um, extroverted thinking for my sister really helps her um, to put out, you know, she, she really it motivates her to, to do something. You know, she's, it enables her to use time management to follow through on her beliefs and to put something out there instead of just, you know, just using ex, you know, introverted feeling as in her world, which she does naturally. So she, she then goes, yes, this is important and now I'm going to do something with it. And I think that's how her extroverted thinking um, helps her. So, uh, in, not in the same way as I do, but certainly um, very importantly, it's important to her not just to, to feel these things, but to make sure she actions them too. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so do you want to um, see the next slide? Um, what was yeah, that? sure. Um, ah, okay. So I, I have this slide on autopilot because um, I think that a lot of us, especially those who are not aware of typology, most people do go through life on autopilot and they just turn up to be whoever it is at whatever time, whatever space they're in, and they just think that being themselves is going to be okay. And I was actually chatting to a pilot who'd been an Air New Zealand pilot for 40 years and he'd only just retired. And then I, I said to him, so what do you miss about your work? And he said, well, I missed the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes. <laughs> the rest when I'm on autopilot is a bit sort of cruisy and dull. And I think in how that relates to typology and especially the, you know, the dominant function is that we're at our best when we're using it and we know we're using it. 
you know, it's like the first 10 minutes and last 10 minutes of his flights. He's using all of his skills to do what it is that he needs to do, you know, to carry this plane forward to get people off the ground and to land it again. That's his, that's his work. And I quite like that as an analogy, just to go, okay, yeah, you can be on autopilot or you can really understand your dominant function, know it's your skill and put it to good use when it's going to come around. And there is, it's like standing at a bus stop. There's lots of buses that come by that aren't yours, but the one that is yours, yeah, get on it because this is your dominant function. Use it. You know, I, I feel a sort of responsibility to, to use my dominant function and I, I hope other people do, do with theirs. So I quite like that, that idea of, you know, don't be on autopilot. Just, you know, intentionally use your dominant function. Um, and I think something that has really helped me all the way through in, type, in my work with type has just been this idea that, um, that the unconscious uh, is unfavorable or dangerous only because we are not at one with it and therefore in opposition to it. Um, just putting that un those, what you might think of unconscious functions into the conscious, I think is really important. And you can't do that without some thought. You know, it really ha does have to have some thinking behind it. Um, and the, the thoughts that I have, I've always put into images. So images and um, imagery, which I've just shown on the screens there. So I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. So I think um, the people who are here may have seen them before. But just having, um, you know, having the images that relate to each of the functions truly helped me to go, yep, this is what this function does. So extroverted sensing that in the moment, just seeing what you've got, being very present with uh, how to deal with what's right in front of you, what's in hand, looking at that 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 guy's eyes just going, what have I got? What, what's here? What am I going to do with it? Um, the introverted sensing, that storage of memories that is ever present and which we go to. Extroverted intuition, I do like Dario's Christmas tree, but I also like this one, this ball in a pinball machine. This is what I, this, how ideas emerge in extroverted intuition. And for introverted intuition, as you know, Richard, there's that, that sort of clearing of the fog to emerge and produce something miraculous at the end of it. Uh, of all of the functions, this is the one I understand the least. So I'm, I'm always keen to hear from anyone who has INTJ preferences. I was actually raised by an INTJ, so in some ways I'm quite familiar with it, but in other ways it's something that is completely intangible for me. And uh, then extroverted thinking, the, the Sudoku puzzle. This is how my brain works, it's, and I just relate to, to that particularly well. Um, compared to introverted thinking, which is all those questions, questioning in and more questions coming out um, with the purpose of just really asking more questions. You know, it's, it's completely different to extroverted thinking. And extroverted feeling that, you know, please can I help you? You know, please may I be of service. That devotion to hospitality and collaboration, and all of those things I think are wonderful. And introverted feeling is that tuning fork that does this resonate? And I think in, introverted feeling, um, I like this image because you know, when you ping a tuning fork, you're, you're seeking resonance, but you can also hear dissonance. And that resonance and dissonance part of introverted feeling, I think, is, is so key to how they, they exist in their world. Is does this feel right? And if it feels wrong, then I feel wrong. You know, I need to get that resonance back. Uh, so it's using you know, all of these functions and, and their opposites is using your dominant and inferior so um yeah helpful just to helpful for me anyway to just to have the the images have you seen those before richard um your particular slides no but I, I mean i'm familiar with the analogy of the tuning fork for introverted feeling and i do think that's such a great one that does seem to resonate with people who's who've uh, experienced an introverted feeling uh so mm. uh this, this i love the pinball metaphor um you know, once you've set the ball off, it kind of takes on a life of its own and you don't know quite where it's going to go, but it, it finds yeah. lots of mm. places to, to, to bounce off. Yeah, and then what I say when I'm describing that one is I say, and then there's the what if. So it's not just one pinball machine. It's what if this pinball machine was three times the size? What if you had three pinball machines? What if you have four balls in the pinball machine and they were all going around and then they ping together and these two ideas ping and you get another idea and this is just miraculous for people with extroverted intuition as a dominant function. Um, and they can't not do it, you know, in the same way that I can't not do extroverted thinking. I can't help myself but to, to organize and sort in my head. Um, so extroverted intuiting is, um, is one of those lovely functions that, that 
also appeals to me greatly. This is probably one, another reason why I, I belong to the type community. <laughs> like, there's so many of them. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm interested in Sudoku because it's not a game that I've played myself. So can you take me through how it looks like extroverted thinking? Yeah, it's just the logic of it. You know, it's just trying to, you know, the idea is that you have numbers one to nine in all of the boxes and you have in, in each of the nine squares. And then you have numbers one to nine in all of the rows and in all of the columns. So you've just got to logically work out where the next number might be. So if you're thinking, well, where's the next three? Well, you'll look along the top row and um, it, then you'll, you'll think in the middle box on the top row, well, there's three, or there's three already there on the left-hand side and there's a three on the right-hand side. So there's only actually one place that the three can go. So you work through the logic um, unemotionally, very objectively. But in fact, how people feel could be something that's represented by one of the numbers. So you, know, you can have a list of pros and cons and the relationships that you have are actually in the list of pros and cons is one of the things that you have to consider when you're putting together your whole sort of framework of whatever it is that you're deciding to do. So, um, so, it's, uh, so for me, it, it works pretty well. I guess there is an effort that you have to put into extroverted thinking or there's an effort that you have to put into doing a Sudoku puzzle. Whereas in fact, when it's actually your dominant function, it's completely effortless. Mm. And I think that's the same with all functions when it's your dominant, is, is you just do it anyway. You don't need any advice, you don't need any, any thinking behind it. And I have an analogy of a, if you imagine you've got a, a jar and you're making a salad dressing and you put in the oil and you put in the vinegar and you put in whatever it is and you shake it all up. And then you let, the, you know, you let it stand on the, uh, on the bench and what automatically happens is it naturally separates. And that's exactly what happens, certainly for extroverted thinking. There's no effort to it. It's just that separation of the, of the information that you have gathered naturally happens. And uh, it's, when, you, when it does, you, you know, you have one of those, you know, happy days. <laughs> zippity doo da. there's my extroverted thinking. It just worked for me and it worked for me again. And, uh, you know, it's, when all of us are using our dominant function, we're in a pretty happy place. Mm, yeah, yeah, and I, I, mean, I just used mine when you were talking about that because even though I don't know Sudoku, you explained how the rules of it work, and then I got into sort of seeing how you were thinking ahead. You know, in the sense that you, you put if if I put this number here, then what will it mean? Several moves ahead, like then this other mm -hmm. goes wrong. If I don't, do you see what I mean? You have to sort of think. Yeah. Am I gonna, how is it? How is my action going to affect the cause yeah. and effect? these other rows and, and ultimately mm. get me to my goal or not. Um, Absolutely. And it's the pleasure of completion. You know, you just do the job, get it all done. All of the numbers are there. All of them are sorted, done. Uh, then usually you celebrate minimally before you get the next Sudoku puzzle that comes along and you start mm. all over again, which is very different to introverted thinking, which just doesn't have an end. Mm. You know, the process just keeps on going. The whole point is not to have an end point. It's just to have another question. Whereas with the extroverted thinking, it absolutely is. You know, you you are a finisher. We are completing this. You know, no matter what happens, we are yeah. going to complete it. Mm. So the two side by sides will really highlight the difference between those two functions, which are actually quite difficult to work out, especially as you know, for novices with type, it, they they can find the difference between extroverted and introverted thinking a bit difficult to to perceive. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's, well, there's a sort of joke with introverted thinking, like this drive for clarity and not non-ambiguity, like this sense mm. of wanting things to be logically consistent, you know, in a in a way that they can't be ambiguous and confusing, and, and you know, they, they've got to stand. It's got to stand on its own logic. Um, mm -hmm. be, be consistent. Yeah, yeah. Defining and refining really is. Um, introverted thinking. Mm, um, we see a lot. We see a lot of that. It, it doesn't know when to stop. You know, if you look out on yeah. media and you see people's introverted thinking getting triggered and getting into like like wordy arguments on mm. media, and, and it really can go on forever, can't it? Once it's once it sets off. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. But when, you know, if introverted thinking invokes the inferior of extroverted feeling, then mm. they're really looking for, um, 
they will often develop a theory in a way that can actually serve and support others. And, and that's the way that, that can, I think, can sometimes um, work. So they, they do need that extroverted feeling. They can't get stuck with introverted thinking. They do need to have that. So why is this thinking helpful to somebody else? And how can I serve and support? And they do, and they can, you know, I've known INTPs and ISTPs, uh, extremely service orientated, uh, but they, they tend to have a theory on it, which is interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just moving on to the, the dominant and inferior function, I've done a lot, quite a bit of work on the archetypes as well, which I'm very happy to share with anyone who would, uh, would like to see it. Um, and I always use icons and images, as we said before. So I think of the dominant function as that controller function, that you know, conductor, if you like, the conductor of the brain. So um, the most developed part of the personality, the lead actor in your personal play, a hero figure when used well you feel strong resilient and satisfied so again it goes back to that you know that that woohoo moment that you get when you know you're using that dominant function like the, the first 10 minutes and last 10 minutes of the, the, the pilot driving the plane um, and then the balance of function the function acts as a balance to the dominant function once developed it can provide a reminder a timely tap on the shoulder to consider the opposite perspective and be cautious so I think when it comes to certainly our conscious functions, we are, um, you know, we that they are there to help you. And I think that's again something that I got from understanding depth typology from Mark Hansiker's point of view, is that the mind is there to keep you safe. And in the same way that the body heals, you know, if you have a cut on your finger, it's going to heal no matter what. The body wants it to heal. It's going to do all of, it, all of its best things quite naturally to then to, to heal itself. And the mind can actually do the same thing. And it's, so the, the balance of function is there to keep you safe. And I, I think that's, that's really important. It's there to make sure the dominant function doesn't just run away with itself. But I also think that the understanding of typology accelerates our ability to be able to bring it into good use. Because if we don't understand what our dominant function is doing, then we, um, you know, if we haven't got an understanding of, of, of type, then we don't actually understand what we're asking of the inferior function either. And so to be present and conscious about that, I think is a really helpful and healthy thing to do. So with, um, from my point of view, uh, so I've got questions from, uh, for extroverted thinking from, introverted feeling. So I've got my Sudoku puzzle there, which I put into the background. So when finally my introverted feeling comes, comes through, then what I'm questioning of myself is, is what does matter most? Is this important? Is the work I'm doing valid, valuable? Does it suit me? Uh, I also like this question is what does my conscience tell me? You know, what, what am I, you know, how can I live with, how can I live with that? I mean, what can I live with? If I can't live with doing something that way, then, then I'm not going to do it. You know, if this doesn't feel right to me, then I'm not going to do it. And, and living with my core values. Um, and I think asking somebody with extroverted thinking to actually name their values, you know, what are the values you live by is really quite an important thing to do. So I, I have uh, three values that I've always sort of, held as dear to me which is um you know commitment integrity and honesty and they hold for me you know i i, I sieve through those values to make sure that i've i'm i've got them at the heart of of what i'm doing and i think different questions come up for, for different types obviously i haven't got all of the eight types uh the eight different options here but i will do at the, the back conference which we'll be um going to but I think each of us need to be listening in and listening out for those questions as we're, as we're going through. That's great, yeah. So what, what kind of values have you discovered? What, what, what can you or can't you live with, do you think, on a personal level for you? Oh, that's an interesting question. I certainly, um, you know, if I go back to the core values I've chosen, I, I cannot live with dishonesty. Um, that's it is impossible for me to do that. Uh, I have to be, um, I have to be honest. I think it's one of the key things that I hope I've taught my, my children. Um, and, and I think actually it sort of changes the, the themes I think that you have in your life, aren't there? You sort of go through various stages and I think it took 
it took quite a while for me to understand kindness and what that means and what I have to do about it. Uh, so I, I think that I can't, you know, I have to live with an, an element of, of, of kindness around me, being kind to others, surrounding myself with people who have kindness as, as something that they have uh, as an attribute in their world too. Um, so that's, that's important as, as well. So I, I think just linking in with those core values and having somebody to talk to about it uh, and not having conversations that are all um, devoid of content from that point of view. So that's, uh, I, I think choosing, your, choosing friends who you can speak to on that level, I think is really important. Mm. And more, I'm getting more important as I get older, I have to say. Mm. Uh, so I had also some quotes to live by, which um, I, I thought were, these, these sort of spoke to me and sort of um, included extroverted thinking as well. When your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. And I think that is the case. You know, you can just go, yes, no, yes, no. Yeah, that doesn't fit with my values. Yeah, so that's a no. Um, this one does, so that's a yes. So this that sort of spoke to me apparently roy disney is walt disney's nephew didn't know that before okay. <laughs> it's kind of thing like that um and then the other one from einstein he said some pretty good things einstein he turns out to be quite a clever bloke um strive not to be a success but rather to be of value and uh, i think that, that that's a shift certainly for extroverted thinking people you know i think you you sort of pretty much go go all out at the beginning of your life um but actually the, that consciousness of being a value comes in a little bit later on, and mm. uh, and certainly, certainly through through the influences that I've had, as I've mentioned to you before. Uh, I also had a go at your um, type, Richard, so you can have a little think about this and see yeah. if this is you. Uh, so questions for introverted intuition from extroverted sensing. Mm. And I put together, you know, what's doable? I've got all of these thoughts. I've got all of these ma magnificent dreams and imaginings and, you know, potential of what could be. Um, but what should I actually be doing now? You know, what's doable? Is now the right time to take action? Um, what is the best way to get a reality check? And what activity can I do to ground myself? Which I've, I've known quite a few um, people with uh, IN, excuse me, INFJ and INTJ preferences who, who feel grounded in doing something physical. So mm. I, I'm interested in, in your view on, on these questions for you. Yeah, well, I think it's the two functions complement in the sense that they reflect the same reality, but from different perspectives. And, mm. you know, that you've got this sort of qualitative patterns and Kind of themes and similarities that kind of underlie the concrete physical world that we live in and then the mm. pre presentation of it on the surface as we experience it um, materially so you know it, they're both speaking to each other I think yeah you know, mm. my natural place is to go to the introverted intuition and that mm. it will just come up when something is qualitatively similar, uh, like before you were describing Sudoku and it, it popped into my head that like chess, the idea of chess and that there's a similarity in chess in mm. you approach it in that you're always thinking several steps ahead. You, you want to see what yeah. your action will, will cause later on in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that, that, the way that chess is, and the way mm. that Goku is, as you described it, they they, yeah. they matched up in my head, like qualitatively. Sure. Mm. That little ping that says, "Ah, yes, they're, they're kind of they're they're, they're, they're related." <laughs> mm. But um, also, I think you know, use, to use your chess analogy as well, that you you know your imaginings are restricted by the rules of the game that certain pieces can only move in certain ways. So it mm -hmm. sort of brings you back to, well, what's actually possible? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. you know, I think is, a, is always a, a good thought. And, um, so that metaphor, yeah, so, think, so, you know, like if I'm coming up with a metaphor or a sort of, some kind of abstract way of seeing reality, then 
ultimately there's going to be a, a physical clues and and what we used to call the reality check there you know the, the stuff oh. you can see quite plainly that will it will illustrate that thing which is more abstract mm. um, yeah i love that like, ancient chinese culture was great for me because it was quite introverted intuitive i think in the way it, it saw the world and mm. sort of taoist kind of um philosophy and things and they talked about um, the seeds, looking for the seeds in the situation. And the seeds are like the kind of the literal um, kind of clues to something that is ultimately a more um, abstract underlying kind of reality mm. underneath it. So, yeah. Mm. I was talking to a, a friend and colleague of mine who has ESFJ preferences. And all of her family are intuitives. Uh, three of them have introverted intuition. And she says that her family nicknamed her the dream crusher because what happened was that every time they come up with a, a novel idea that they thought was fantastic, she would give them a hundred reasons why it wasn't possible. And so I think that sometimes if, if that sensing function uh, is not wise, then it can be critical. And I think you need to turn it around to be something that gives you wisdom and not something that just stops you from doing what you think is, um, you know, what your imagination has, has told you is, is a viable option. Yeah, I think that the, the level to which introvert intuition wants to really grasp and understand the world in quite a holistic way, you know, the thing that stands in the way of that is the... Um, the practical physical reality you know mm. you know even being a living human being you know you've got a limit yeah. of span there is mm. resources and so on to yeah. you know whether mm. in the world of ideas you can expand infinitely almost you know, they, yeah. they have the same restrictions and so mm. that's, that's kind of almost a dream crushing effect is that you know the tangible world is it has limitations that mm. it, well, so another question for you is is extroverted sensing ever pleasing for you yeah absolutely and like yourself it, it's something that came more into my life as i got older um you know it's something mm. i literally blocked out most of the time it wasn't in my body a lot as a yeah. young person but through yeah. through various activities like getting into dancing and things like that it sort of yeah it, it really brought me more into that present mm. world yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. And, and uh, I think we we all need to get that message. You know, somehow or other, we need to listen to that because it is important um, that we that we do listen to that inferior function and, and just work with it and in a positive way, rather than just having us being um, this, this critical, you know, pain in the neck that that stops you having all the fun. So, uh, yeah. so that's important. Mm. As much I just as it a, can be a dream crusher, it can be a dream enabler. If, if yes, you know, absolutely. Together, yeah, I yeah. think that's a really good way of, of putting it. Yeah, I think that is what extroverted sensing does for introverted intuition. Um, I came across these quotes. So again, you can tell me your opinion on these. Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Mm. Interesting, yeah. I mean, I think there's, certainly for an INTJ, you know, this, the, having the extroverted thinking there and the, the doing side of it, Mm. Um, certainly yeah i'm not sure whether it would fit as much for for the infjs out there um, mm. so, um the real risk is doing nothing mm. i mean ultimately i think there's an existential thing going on there you know this uh yeah mm. this 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 thing of like how how can somebody in their life fulfill the purpose of their dominant function you know just be satisfied with their life overall and yeah you know, it's, it's quite a big task with introverted intuition to, to really try and yeah grasp that that bigger picture mm. to its full extent um mm. yeah no, i can understand that um so just going back to these reflections i come back to just that uh thoughts that i have on on the inferior function just how to make how to make most of it just wanting to i think is step one and um yeah it's uh it, it's been an interesting diversion for me to really focus on it and and see what i can get from it and hopefully 
uh, when we have the, the workshop at, at BAT, we'll look closer at it and see what everybody else gets from, from their introverted, uh, their, their inferior functions too. Fantastic. See how it goes. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. So, yeah, right. April um, and the conference is on sale right now. We've got uh, every day I'm seeing the people um, bookings coming in. It's, it's looking like a great event mm. here again. Great. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so I think we'd better wrap up because we've gone a little bit over time, but it's, um, it's been great hearing your thoughts on, um, on this amazing topic. And like you said, there's so many combinations of these uh, to go into with everybody. So you're mm. looking forward to your work. Yeah, and yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. It's, there's, there's no better place to learn about personality types than, um, than a room full of different personalities and especially a room full of personalities. You understand typology, which is fabulous. <laughs> so, so it would be great. Well, marvellous. Well, um, we've got a question come in. It's probably a bit late, unfortunately. It was about um, next time. We'll ask that next time. Thank you very much, Sue, for joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome. That's great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Richard. All the best. I'll see you in April. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.